So um, you've mentioned um, about uh, the fact that our genes um, evolved in the environment of a competition and uh, about uh, the sort of evolution of the world we live in. So let me ask you this. In a world of abundance, uh, in a world in which potentially artificial intelligence peacefully coexists with us, um, do you think that the political economic system which underpins humanity currently, uh, such as capitalism, would have to go? Because, I mean, if you look at it at its core, it's a very social Darwinian kind of a system of zero-sum yes, game of competition, survival of the fittest, and so on. And what do you see could be the alternative structures that can take us uh, to well, the next level? Well, we're already level? moving away from that. I mean, we are creating works that would be inconceivable even decades ago, even a decade ago, through shared pooled collective efforts. Wikipedia is the classic example of something where nobody is getting paid. Well, maybe one or two, or two administrators at the Wikimedia Foundation, but nobody is getting paid. Everybody is contributing, and everybody recognizes the value of this. Um, the whole Internet ecology of creating and giving and it goes back, you know, even 20 years ago, people were writing utilities that were needed and giving them away. Yes, there was shareware and there were people trying to monetize it. But the most successful things that people create are things that they just give away. And, of course, there's, you know, this famous argument that free is the new best price for everything. And maybe freemium might make some sense. But freemium is still an attempt at capitalism. Free, where you just do something. You go to my web page, as an example. And I've got all kinds of how to write advice. People read that all the time. It's the most popular part of my web page. I don't monetize it. I don't try to sell them my book. Just go. Here's how you do characterization. Here's how you do dialogue. Here's some notes on how you create a plot. Go read it. Help. It's fine. Have fun. Go write your own books. If you want to read my books, if you don't want to read my books, it has nothing to do with it. I'm just giving. And everybody else is giving. You're giving when you do these interviews. So, uh, the notion of capitalism, I mean, we're seeing right now that capitalism is a creaky structure. As you and I talk in November of 2011, the Occupy Wall Street and Occupy Toronto and Occupy, the, the, the world is rising up and saying this notion that it should all be about hierarchies. No, it's a flat world we live in now. The world is flat, as uh, the title of the book goes. Thomas it's a Friedman. world in which... Um, there's plenty for everybody, and the ones that you have to rail against are the ones who want to treat it still like it's an environment of scarcity. Uh, will capitalism fall by the wayside? Yes, I imagine it will. Um, do we see things like socialism actually working on the World Wide Web? To some considerable degree, we do. Uh, the tragedy of the commons which is the real world example of where, you know, you can't all share feeding grounds for your livestock, doesn't really transfer to the World Wide Web. The World Wide Web, we don't see the tragedy of the commons. We don't see, by and large, Wikipedia or YouTube or Twitter ending up being destroyed by its free users. We, end up, we see them becoming strong, powerful forces for social change because of their free users. And... What about the place of religion in that new world? Uh, would it be on the rise or would it be diminishing and, and eventually, uh, you know, evaporating completely? I recently interviewed so Sonia Arison on her book uh, 100 Plus, And in that book, she argues interestingly, uh, and she says that it was a counterintuitive conclusion that she got to after a lot of research on the topic that uh, once we actually uh, overcome our basic uh, or provide sufficiently for our basic uh, necessities and uh, extend our, long, our lives beyond 100 years and even more, surprisingly perhaps we would be even more interested in religion and spiritualism in general rather than less. And therefore she believes and she argues in her book that uh, religion would not be disappearing, but perhaps be getting more popular as we progress in time? Well, it's an interesting question. Religion as religion and spirituality are different things. Yes. You have to make a distinction. Absolutely. Religion 
has a couple of sine qua nons, without which nothing. One is a belief in the supernatural. Often and almost always in terms of supernatural superior beings. Another is a belief in the afterlife, that there is an existence beyond this existence. Whether or not those will stand the test of time in the coming millennia, I'm doubtful. I think we will come to realize um, that the world we live in is explicable without recourse to magic, which is what religion is. It's saying, you know what, physics, quantum fluctuations in the vacuum, natural selection, uh, none of those things explain why we're here. Well, guess what? They actually do. And the more people who reach a level of education and intellectual um, prowess to be able to comprehend that, the less likely we are to say, well, no, there's, you know, it's the God of the gaps. Well, we haven't explained this little bit, so God isn't there. Oh, we did explain that? Well, then look over here for God. Oh, I didn't realize that quantum physicists had filled in that bit. Oh, maybe God's over here. Eventually, you reach a point where there just is no place to invoke magic and the supernatural. So oh, I, I think science fiction writers as a whole were entirely too optimistic about when the transition from a religious, a largely religious to a largely secular world would take place. Clearly in the United States, um, the religious right has an enormous amount of power. Clearly in the Islamic world, the religious um, uh, community has a lot of power, not just the fundamentalists, but just in general, a religious society. And, and you know, the aberration, which is Canada, a, a somewhat secular society, Western Europe, which is quite secular, those are aberrations on the globe. Um, and we have to recognize that, you know, rounded to the nearest billion, all seven billion of us are theists. Rounded to the nearest billion, all seven billion of us are theists. Will it disappear over time? Yes, I suspect it probably will. Now, that said, spiritualism is something else. Spiritualism, at least in some definitions, are simply asking the big questions. Uh, it is possible to take from Darwinian natural selection, from quantum physics, from evolutionary psychology, that it doesn't mean anything, that, that there's no point to existence, a nihilistic approach to it. And I think, actually, that's not the case. Some of the beauty of quantum physics is that perhaps the observer plays a material role in shaping reality. These aren't mystical notions. These are fascinating and arguably spiritual notions. Are we going to dispense with wondering why we are here? What does it all mean? What is the purpose of life? No. Are we going to throw out the answer that we're here because a petty superior being created entities so that it would have something that would worship it? Yes. I think that's already well on the way out. Mm -hmm. And and just uh, for the record, uh, how would you qualify your own self uh, with respect to religion? Are you an atheist? Are you an agnostic? Are you a believer? First, we have to define the terms. I'm not going to dodge answering, but first we have to define the terms because people in particular misuse the term agnostic all the time. Uh, a Coke, Pepsi, I'm agnostic, meaning I don't have an opinion uh, or I'm not sure. What agnosticism actually means from the Greek is that the nature of the divine is inherently unknowable. Not that I don't know, but that it's unknowable, which is, we, we intuitively understand that, that no matter how long we spend staring down at an anthill, the ants staring up at us will never comprehend human society. It is unknowable to them. Ants are agnostic in the strict definition about humanity. They simply cannot comprehend it. It's beyond their ken, their ken, their ability to not, uh, acknowledge and understand. So when people say agnostic and they I haven't made up my mind, they're not using the term correctly. They're undecided is what they mean, or they just don't know, but they're not agnostic. That said, I'm not an agnostic. I'm actually an atheist. I have decided after a considerable amount of research into this and a lifelong exploration of these issues that the preponderance of the evidence is that the universe is explicable by natural law and that there's no need to invoke the supernatural in any way, shape, or form. And what we sometimes call Occam's razor, Occam's razor or the principle of parsimony, the simplest explanation prevails. And there are those who will say, well, the simplest explanation for everything is to invoke a creator. It isn't because all it does is push it back one level. 
How did the creator get there? Well, then you have to invoke another creator, another one, and it's turtles all the way down. <laughs> to me, there's no part of the human experience and no part of the natural world and no part of my own or others' spiritual thinking that cannot be explained by recourse to a world that does not have an afterlife, I do not believe in it, or a supreme guiding intelligence that is external to the material world. I do not believe in that either. I'm an atheist. That said, we will eventually, with our computing equipment, be able to simulate reality perfectly, indistinguishably from fantasy. So one could argue that we are some future technology simulation, that you and I and all the people watching this are the science project of some vastly advanced high school student, thousands or millions of years or billions of years, down the road from where we are now. I don't dispute that that's a possibility, but that is a possibility that is indwelling in the universe. It is a possibility of natural law. Um, I doubt it simply because it doesn't seem likely. Uh, as this, it, it's, it's an added layer. It's, it's not the parsimonious explanation. But I don't dismiss it. I do dismiss that some spooky supernatural being created us. Uh, if we were created, we were created by a scientist. <laughs> Very interesting. Um, time is advancing, so let me move on to a few questions about uh, your general body of work. And I want to start up with this uh, sort of a broad question. You've already mentioned a few other science fiction writers. Um, is there, who is your favorite science fiction writer, first of all? Of all time, it's Arthur C. Clarke. He's dead, of course. Um, but Arthur C. Clarke was the guy who demonstrated for me that you could really write about what are traditionally considered metaphysical issues without becoming flaky, without becoming spacey, let's say. Uh, and he tackled all sorts of fundamental questions in Childhood's End, in the Nine Billion Names of God, uh, in The Star, some in great depth, some in lesser depth. But he made it clear, and of course in 2001, that you can grasp, um, you can grapple with very difficult existential uh, issues through the medium of science fiction. After Clark, it's H.G. Wells, Herbert George Wells, who is the father of the kind of science fiction I, I, I write, which is science fiction as social comment, science fiction that uses metaphor and disguise to speak about the here and now. Um, Wells was writing about the things that were of great concern to him. War of the Worlds is about British colonialism. Time Machine is about the class system in Great Britain. And I'm writing about things that are of great concern to me. Uh, and that I want to share. I'm didactic in that sense. I've got a soapbox, and I do believe that good fiction has a message. And you're free as the reader to agree or disagree. In fact, I invite you to disagree. If you're a reader who's inclined to authorship, I encourage you to write the countervailing novel. In many ways, Wake is my response to William Gibson, who I admire Bill, I know Bill. In fact, I'm interviewing Bill at the Toronto Public Library in January, since you're in Toronto, come on out. Absolutely, um, I'll be there. He's a brilliant stylist, but I actually, I actually think that his vision of the future of technology as outlined in Neuromancer, now a quarter of a century ago, is wrong. I mean, it's demonstrably wrong. It's not the way the world turned out to be. So, Wake is a response to William Gibson. Uh, Joe Haldeman with the Forever War is a response to Robert Heinlein with uh, Starship Troopers. Uh, if somebody dislikes what I'm writing, I encourage you, join the dialogue. It's a big, wide field, science fiction and philosophy. Um, don't expect me to promulgate your view, but you, please, step up to the plate and present your view as passionately as you can. I'm going to present mine as passionately as I can, and through the dialogue, people will decide where they want to be. I'm not out to convert anybody. I'm simply out to say, here's what I think. Tell me what you think. We'll have a dialogue. That dialogue will evolve over a series of works. 